Don't lose yourself. Don't lose, I always say to you today, don't lose your soul. Now we'll see there in my key verse there that the proverb, it tells us once again, that righteousness, that righteousness guards those whose way is blameless. In other words, righteousness, it keeps the blameless upright. Now, if you notice there in my key verse for today, there is a battle that is taking place there against wickedness. And in order for us to remain upright against wickedness, again, righteousness is what we need to be able to remain upright against wickedness. Whereas we'll see there, the sinner in this battle has no protection. The sinner, we're told there in that proverb, has no protection against wickedness, and therefore wickedness, it overtakes them. The sinner, we know, will be found guilty of their wickedness, to which again, we know that their end is eternal condemnation. That is their reward. So our goal today should be to remain blameless, right? Our goal today should be to remain upright while we are on this journey because we do not want to be rewarded with eternal condemnation, do we? Now, Paul, he wrote that the blameless, he wrote that they are those who obey God without complaining and without dispute. If you desire to remain upright, if you desire to be blameless in the eyes of God, again, you must be one who lives in obedience to God without complaining and without dispute. In other words, the blameless, you, you should strive to live by faith sincerely, genuinely. And so I ask you today, are you living in that manner? Are you living in a way that will be blameless in the eyes of the Lord? Now, sadly, many today are being overtaken by wickedness. Many are being overtaken by wickedness today. Many are falling to wickedness. Many are falling to sin today. As I said in my last sermon, in the first sermon of this series, we are an adulterous generation. We are a generation that is on the verge of becoming a lost generation with how far we have strayed away from the instructions that God has given to us. So what must we do to correct our way? What must we do in order to remain upright? What must we do to be blameless in the eyes of God? What must we do not to be overtaken by wickedness while we are on this journey? As we saw in my first sermon of this series, we must first recognize the sign that has been given to us by God. We must recognize that sign and we must follow that sign. The sign that was given to us by God is his only begotten son. As I said in the first sermon, Jesus, he stood as proof of the Lord. He stood as proof of God. He stood as proof of his word, his instructions. He stood as proof of salvation, the promise that God has given to all of us. Are you following Jesus today? Have you recognized the sign of God? And again, I ask you today, as I asked a couple of weeks ago, are you following the sign? Now, after committing ourselves to following Christ, we'll see that there is more that we need to do in order for us to be able to remain upright while we are on this journey. In order for us to, to know what to do, I want us to take a look at what Peter had to say today. So if you will, join me in turning over to 2 Peter. And I want you to take a look what's said in the first chapter of 2 Peter and the fifth verse. This is a verse that we are going to refer to often 
throughout this series. It's going to serve as background scripture for a lot of the sermons that I will be sharing with you over the next month. Now, you'll see there in that scripture that Peter, he wrote that with all diligence, we must first add to our faith virtue, he said there. Virtue. We must add virtue to our faith. Now, some of us, we may wonder, well, what is virtue? Well, we define virtue as a particular moral excellence. We define, we define virtue as a standard of right, valor, merit, courage, and integrity. I hope you hear those words today of how we define virtue. In other words, we would define virtue as a sense of honesty. Virtue, it essentially speaks to the mindset by which we live what we are mindful of, what it is that, that guides the actions that we take on this journey. The moral and the ethical standards by which we live. What does your moral and ethical standards, what does your values, what does it say about you? See, the believer, the believer should have high moral and ethical standards. We should have, we should be living by a high virtue. And, and the reason why I say that today is because our virtues, they are not set by, by us. We don't set our own virtues as followers of Christ. Our virtues, they have been set by God himself. And God, he has said to us that his thoughts, they are higher than our thoughts, that his ways, they are, they are higher than, than our worry, than our ways. So if we are following Christ today, we should be following a way that is higher than the coming man. We should be living by a, a way that is higher than that that is of the world. Paul, he summed up the virtues of the believers best when he said to the Corinthians, when he spoke to them about faith, hope, and love, that is charity. The virtues of the believer is faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, and love is what we need in order to remain upright on this journey. Faith, hope, and love is what we need in order to not be overthrown, in order not to be overtaken by wickedness while we are on this journey. And so the question that all of us must answer today is whether or not faith, hope, and love, whether or not those three things have rule over us. Does faith have rule over you? Does hope have rule over you? Does love have rule over you? Are you living by faith? Are you living by hope? Are you living by love today? Are you living according to these Christ-like values? That is what we must answer today. I share with all of you again today that I have great concern about this generation. I am greatly concerned about this generation. And when I say this generation, I'm talking about the whole world, all of those who are present and living in the world today. This generation, I am greatly concerned about because I believe, and I think that I have noticed this, and I don't believe that I am alone on this. I believe that there is a steady decline when it comes to living by faith, when it comes to living by hope, when it comes to living by love. 
I am greatly concerned about the moral compass of the world today. I don't know about you. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm on an island all alone, but I am greatly concerned about the moral compass of the world today. You see, people of honesty and integrity, they are seemingly becoming harder and harder to come by. People of honesty and integrity, they are seemingly becoming harder and harder to find today. And as I take a look around, and if I am honest with all of you today, I don't even know if today's generation even have a moral compass. I won't get no amens on that one. I feel like the values of faith, hope, and love, I feel like they are forgotten in our society. I feel like faith, hope, and love, I feel like they are forgotten in our community. Frankly, I believe today that the way of godly living, I believe that that is becoming more a thing of the past. As our moral compass is beginning to, to lose direction. And we are, again, being overtaken today by wickedness. And those who are rejoicing in wickedness today. So how is today's generation how is it losing its moral compass? How are we losing our moral values? How are we getting away from godly living today? The 13th chapter of Proverbs, what we read from responsibly today, I believe that it sheds some light on this subject. Leave it shed some light on what our moral compass, what it should be. But at the same time, because it shed a light on what our moral compass should be, it also sheds some light on some very harsh truths in the manner in which we are living in today. For example, there in the second verse there, the proverb it states that a man shall eat well by the fruit of his mouth, but the soul of the unfaithful, I like underlying this, the soul of the unfaithful, the proverb says, feeds on violence. Are we feeding on violence today? Think about that for a moment here. Now, the notion of this proverb, it speaks about the virtue of love. Faith, hope, and love, right? You see, with a, a cross-reference over to the 10th chapter and the 11th verse, we are told that the mouth of the righteous is a well of life. The, 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 again, the 10th chapter of Proverbs and 11th verse said that the mouth of the righteous is a well of life. The righteous should be sharing words that, that uplift. We should be moving in a place of love, from a place of love that, again, that uplifts. Are we doing that today? Are we uplifting in our society today? Are we uplifting in our community today? Whereas, again, violence, the 10th chapter of Proverbs and 11th verse said there, said violence covers the mouth of the wicked. Today's generation is a generation, I tell you, that feeds off of violence rather than they love. I won't get no amens on that. This is a harsh truth, but hey, it's the truth. Today's generation is a generation that feeds off of violence rather than love. And I want to be very clear about this as well. Violence doesn't just speak about physical violence. There are more ways to be violent than just physically. You see, many people are hurt and harmed today psychologically. 
That is mentally. Many people are hurt and harmed today emotionally. And, and when you think about it, physical harm, psychological, mental harm, emotional harm, it can affect and will affect the soul, the inner man, who you are. You see, today's generation is a generation that loves to harm each other. Oh, I won't get no amens there. Today's generation is a generation that moves out of anger. It's a generation that moves out of hatred. Just take a look around. It's a generation that moves out of bitterness. You see, rather than feeding hope to others, rather than inspiring others to do something to uplift, to prosper others, we, we feed hatred. We feed doubt to others. We feed fear. Look at all the fear mongering that's going on in the world today. That's what we feed each other. Many people today suffer from physical, psychological, and emotional abuse today from those who love to feed off of violence. Many people are suffering today physically, mentally, and emotionally today from all of those who love to incite that type of abuse. From those who I would say have lost their way. And what's truly sad about this is that the abused, they are crying out today. But as the abused, as they cry out, many of us, we just shrug our shoulders, don't we? We, we shrug our shoulders at their suffering and we turn away from them, ignoring their cries of suffering. What does that say about us? Well, we should be living with a virtue of faith, hope, and love. What does it say about us when we don't care about the abuse when we don't care about the suffering that others are going through. We won't care unless it comes our way and it harms us. Many of us, we have become numb to the suffering of others. We turn on the news, we see somebody got killed and we just shrug our shoulders and we say, oh, well, that's, you know, hey, that happens all the time. Ain't that what we say? I remember when I was in the eighth grade, or maybe I was in the ninth grade, when the, the, the first mass shooting at a school that I can recall happened. And it was a big deal. But now, it's just another thing. That's how numb we have grown as a people to, to the hurt and to the suffering of others. Again, we are feeding off violence today rather than feeding off love. And we wonder how we have lost our moral compass. And how are we losing our moral compass today? The third verse there states that one who is careful about their words, they preserve their life. Everybody see that there? It. I want you to think on that. I want you to stew on that for a moment. And the proverb said there that one who is careful about their words, they preserve their life. I want you to understand that the notion that is being spoken of there in this proverb is about integrity, honesty, right? And, and, and I would, again, I would say to all of you today, I don't know if I'll get an amen on this. I don't know if you will agree with me on this, but I definitely believe that integrity is lost on this generation. I believe that integrity, I believe that honesty, I believe that it is lost on this generation. All I have to do is open up YouTube. All I have to do is turn on the news. And all I can see when I do that is a whole bunch of lies. No, I won't get no amens on that. The rest of that verse there, it speaks to 
the, the wide opening of the lips there. This generation, as it opens wide its lips with lies, tales, stories, gossip, conspiracies, it's opening up its lips wide to destruction. See, our moral compass was lost the day we fell in love with lies. Our moral compass, it was lost the day when we fell in love with a whole bunch of gossip, a whole bunch of mess, listening to a whole bunch of mess, hungering for it, thirsting for it. Our moral compass, it was lost the day that we fell in love with conspiracy theories rather than the truth. Oh, boy. How are we losing our moral compass today? How are we straying further and further away from godly living today? Just take a look at what's said there in the seventh verse. The seventh verse there, it states that there are those who pretend to be rich, but have nothing. While those who have, those who are rich, they act poor because they want more. They, they, are, they are filled with greed. Look at that again. Those who don't have pretending to be rich. I certainly believe that's something that's happening in our society today. I don't have to look far. Again, I won't get no amens on that one. How many of us pretending to be rich today? Oh boy. Me and the rich, acting like they poor, don't have enough. So they got to go out and get more and more and more. And, and in this society, there are many who don't see anything wrong with that kind of mindset. But as Paul wrote to Timothy, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Our moral compass, it was lost the day man began to value money and wealth over life. I'm going to get no amens on that as well. Our moral compass, I want you to again hear this today, loud and clear. Our moral compass, it was lost the day we began to fall in love with, with dead presidents over the living. Oh, boy. And Jesus, he warned against covetousness. He warned us about greed when he said that those who lay up treasures only for themselves, they aren't rich toward God. You see, I desire to be rich toward God. I ain't worried about the dead presidents. There are many today who actually have gained some kind of wealth, but they ain't rich. And you see, the reason why they ain't rich is because they're not rich toward God. You see, being rich toward God, that's what really matters. See, again, this is a generation that has lost its way. This is a generation that is losing its moral compass or maybe don't even have one at all. We are losing our moral compass today. And for what? For what reason? For what? What is it that we're losing our moral compass for? For the love of violence? For the love of lies, for the love of gossip, for the love of conspiracies, for the love of pretend wealth. See, that's all that has been gained in this world today. Pretend. Pretend love, pretend truth, pretend wealth. Oh, boy, not going to get no amens. That's fine. I'd be on the island all alone. I don't mind preaching on the island all alone. Jesus, he asked, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and lose his own soul? We are losing our soul today, I believe, and we're losing our soul today for nothing. In the end, there has been no growth in the soul of man because we love violence. We love what is pretend love. Pretend truth, pretend wealth. We have gained little to nothing in this world because many of us, we are playing make-believe 
rather than living in reality. The reality in which we need to get our souls right so that we can remain upright on this journey and not be overtaken by wickedness. Because again, we know that if we are overtaken by wickedness, if we are overtaken by sin, we know the end result. We know that it is eternal condemnation. That is what should matter while you are on this journey. Not the make-believe, not the pretend wealth, not the pretend truth, and not the pretend love. Rather than a moral compass, we have a world today that is filled with prideful and egotistical maniacs. And I'm going to keep it real just like that. There in the 10th verse, the scripture states that by pride comes nothing but strife. I look around in the world today. And again, that's what we see in the world today. A whole bunch of strife, a whole bunch of mess. The 11th verse, it states there that wealth gained by dishonesty is wealth that will be diminished. It will go away. It will not last. Like I said, it's pretend wealth. Mm -hmm. I want true wealth today. <laughs> Just take a look at our world today. I, again... I am concerned about this generation. Again, I look at the world today, and again, I see a world that's filled with a whole bunch of strife, all because one must have more than the other. You have to have more than me, and I have to have more than you. What has that benefited anybody? We don't even care about each other. Rather than talking to one another, we talk at each other. Rather than caring about what you may be going through, rather than caring about what I may be going through, we could not care less. With each generation that passes by, rather than growth, Rather than improvement, we have managed to fall backwards. When the only thing that we can talk about in our advancements as a society is this little thing or this that I am preaching from, computers, when that's all that we have to brag about in our growth and in our advances, I tell you today that we are lost. The fact that you can hate me because the color of my skin, the fact that that is still around today, that again says a lot about our society. The fact that you can't love me because I drive a Honda Civic while you driving the next fancy car, that again, that says a lot about our society. The fact that you would judge me based on what I wear, that again, that says a lot about our society today. I honestly frown when I think about today's growing generation in comparison to the generations of my parents. Some of y'all are that generation. My grandparents, my great-grandparents, and then all those that came before them. I wish I could trace back further. You see, we are missing something that they actually understood very well. You see, they live with a mindset that was geared toward God. I know that because I heard it all when I was growing up. I grew up in the church. I was raised in the church. And then when I was outside of the church, my uncles and aunts, my grandparents, they would talk about God as well. They live with a mindset that was geared toward the Lord, and therefore they believed in God and living. I just lost an uncle who, who truly did believed in right and wrong according to God. Whether they fully understood the Lord's word or not, they believed in doing right by each other. Yeah, I know this because I can look at my family on both sides. You know, my mom, she stays in contact with, with, with her brother and her sisters. 
When my dad, when he was living, he stayed in contact with his brothers and his sisters. You know, nowadays, again, we don't talk to each other. And I'm bad on it. You know, I go into my own bubble. I come out every now and then. But godly living, it was a pillar of strength. It was a pillar of power for, for those generations, which, which some of you are a part of. And, and leaning on though that strength and that power to godly living, it helped them to be able to overcome. It helped them to be able to endure. What is the growing generation uh, today, what is it going to do? as it continues to be met head on with trials and tribulations and afflictions from every side. What are we going to do? How are we going to overcome? How are we going to endure if we aren't living according to the way of God? I tell you today that godly living needs to be a pillar of power and strength in the world today. Again, I tell you today that godly living, it needs to be a pillar of power and strength in today's generation. So how does today's generation make a return to God living since we are, since we have strayed so far away from it? The first step again can be found there in second Peter, the first chapter of second Peter and the fifth verse. Well, if you're still looking at that verse there, Peter, he again called on us believers to add virtue to our faith. Now, as we look further at that verse there, we will notice that Peter said that we must add virtue. He said we must do it with all diligence. In other words, there should be no breaks taken in adding virtue to your faith. There should be no vacation days when it comes to growing in your faith. Now, let's be even more clear about this. The life of every believer is one to be lived with a serious mindset for faith. For faith and for growing in faith. Again, listen closely to that. As a believer, you should be living with a serious mindset towards your faith. Sadly, many believers today, they view faith as an activity to participate in only one day a week, only on Sundays. I got to get up and go to church today. It's Sunday. I got to be a believer today is what many people move like many so-called believers, professed believers. If you view faith as a once a week activity, then again, I tell you today that you're practicing religion and not faith. Your faith ain't sincere. It's not genuine. In fact, your faith, it ain't real. To remain upright with godly living, again today, we must be serious in every aspect of our faith. We should be serious in our prayer life. We should be serious in our studying of the word. We should be serious when it comes to doing right by each other. Again, we must have the utmost seriousness in every aspect of our faith. How many of us are serious about our faith today? You see, one who is serious about their faith is one that will be ready to endure their inflictions. One who is serious about their faith today, they will be ready to endure their trials and their tribulations. They will be able to endure, and not only will they endure, they will overcome the enemy. How many of us are going to be serious about our faith today? If again, you desire to remain upright on this journey and not to be overcome by wickedness, you must take your faith serious today. If you're going to take your faith, your safe, your faith serious today, say, Pastor, I'm going to take my faith serious today. Now, there's a second step there that we'll find when it comes to returning to God and living so that we can remain upright on this journey. And we find it there in the first verse of the 13th chapter of Proverbs. There in the 13th chapter, the first verse of Proverbs, 
one is encouraged to be like a wise son who heeds his father's instructions rather than being like a scoffer. Now, scoffers, they are those that mock or show contempt, hatred, and hostility is what scoffers are. They scoff. Scoffing at God's instructions, I tell you today, that's what has kept us from reaching the full potential of our blessings. In the past, the children of Israel, they scoffed at the law that was given to them by God. And many of them, because they scoffed at the law that was given to them by the Lord, they were either conquered or destroyed. If they weren't conquered or destroyed, they were carried away and lived under oppression. So many of them who scoffed at the Lord, they ended up missing out on the promise of salvation. And because they missed out on the promise of salvation, as Paul said in the 11th chapter of Romans and the 11th verse, salvation, it has come to all of us. It has come to everybody because they scoffed. Today, we must obey God's instructions. We must not scoff at the instructions given to us by God. We must obey God's instructions with all diligence, once again. Peter, he said there in the first chapter, in uh, first Peter, in the 14th verse, he said that as obedient children, we must not conform ourselves to former lust. As Paul put it, the reason why we should not conform to those lusts is because we have been transformed by the renewing of our mind through what Christ did for us by giving himself, by giving his life for us. We have received the Holy Spirit who around the clock is transforming our mind. So when we remain obedient to God's instructions of godly living, we are able to prove what is the perfect will of the Lord. We aren't living according to the world we are living according to his word. And again, we are able to remain upright while we are on this journey. We will not be overcome by wickedness. We will not lose our moral and ethical values. Therefore, we will not lose our way because we are living in obedience to the way that is higher than ours. And then we are living again according to the mindset that is higher than ours. We are living according to the way of the Lord. Scripture, it repeatedly encourages us believers to abhor, to despise, and to hate all that is wicked. And we should be doing it with malice. How many of us are doing that today? Again, there in my key verse for today, we are told there, that again, the righteous should hate lying. How many of us hate lying today? How many of us are living by the truth today? If you are living by the truth today, say, Pastor, I'm living by the truth. I got some mumbles there. I don't know if y'all are living by the truth. If you're living by the truth today, I want to hear you. Say, Pastor, I'm living by the truth. Now, there's a third step that I want to share with you all here when it comes to godly living, returning to it so that we can again remain upright while we are on this journey. If you still have your finger there in 1 Peter in the first chapter, I want you to take a look at the 13th verse there. Peter, he tells us, he tells the believer there to gird up the loins of our mind, and then he tells us to be sober-minded, he said there. So in this statement here, Peter, he's encouraging believers to, to get ready for the revelation of Christ. We Today, we live in an age where Jesus said that the kingdom of God is at hand. Sadly, no matter how much it is preached that the kingdom of God is at hand, this generation ignores that word. 
rather than getting prepared to stand before the Lord, this is a generation that lives as if it will never face judgment from the Lord. They're like they'll never stand before their creator. So to be sober-minded means that one is present and fully aware of the day. Are you aware of the day in which you live in? Godly living, that requires us to be fully aware of sinful living rather than ignoring it. Many of us, we ignore sinful living today. We ignore our own sin, sinful living today. We try to justify it today because, again, we have lost our moral compass. You see, if we live in awareness that the kingdom of God is at hand, if we live in an awareness that we will stand before the Lord then we would actually fear the Lord. We would fear his judgment. We would fear how he would judge the manner in which we are living. And so therefore we would improve the way in which we are living. We would get back to godly living. So with a sober mind, we wouldn't feed off of violence, would we? We would feed off of love. Rather than turning a blind eye to the suffering of others, one with a sober mind would be like the Good Samaritan, wouldn't they? How many of us are like the Good Samaritan today? Rather than being consumed by selfishness and, and greed, the one with a sober mind would be one that is generous in their giving. One that is generous in their love. How many of us have a sober mind today? are fully aware in the manner in which they are living. Are you living according to the way of God? Is your living, is it godly living today? In the past, when people cried out for love and equality, when they cried out for godly living, the scoffers, they did what they do. They scoffed. They mocked. They mocked the idea of love and equality. They mock the idea, they scoff at the idea of loving people who are different from them, who have a different color of skin, who may not talk like they do, who may not dress like they do. And guess what it did? It set generations back. Still to this day, the scoffer scoffs at the idea of godly living, of love, honor, respect, equality, as we saw in the Sunday school lesson today. There are scoffers today who look at women as objects, who look at women as being weak. And again, they continue to set generations back. The Lord, again, shows us that there is strength and power in godly living. There is strength in unity. There is strength in harmony. So why are we as a community, why are we becoming the scoffers? Why are we scoffing at the idea of love, honor, and respect today? Why are we scoffing at the idea of helping each other, of walking together? Why are we rejoicing at being separated? Why are we rejoicing at being apart? Why are we so far moving against one another? It doesn't make much sense to me today. By following these steps of adding virtue to our faith, I tell you today that we can return. We can return to having a moral compass, one of high ethical values, where we care for one another, where we don't simply talk at each other, but we talk to each other. We know each other. We know our neighbors. They aren't just somebody that lives by us or somebody that's just walking next to us. We will know who they are. We will understand their plight and we will care for them. We will help them. We will uplift them. If we return back to godly living, the pillar of love, the pillar of hope, the pillar of faith, the pillar of power that we are so missing out on today. You see, when we find our moral compass today, when we return to godly living today, I tell you today that we can overcome that scoffer. We can overcome that doubter. The one who is so against us today, we can overcome them. 
We can overcome him and we can overcome all of the wickedness that continues to hinder us as a community and as a society today. I hope today that you see the value of returning to godly living. And I hope that a generation that is starting to lose its soul, that's becoming a lost generation, I hope that it can see the value of faith, love, and hope. The virtues of again being ready, having a sober mind, living in obedience to the word of God, walking faithfully. I hope that we can find that today. As Peter said there in the 15th verse of the first chapter of 1 Peter, our goal is to be holy just as he who called us is holy. That is our goal today. To again, be fruitful. That is our goal today. Is it too much for us today? Is it too much to ask for us to commit ourselves to godly living? Is that too much? Is it too hard for you? I hope not. To today's generation, I call on us to return to those values that we have forgotten. I call on us to commit our way to the Lord. I call on us to commit our way to godly living. Will you do that today? Amen. 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 Thanks for watching this week's sermon. I hope that you enjoyed this week's message and I hope that you'll share it with someone somewhere. If you haven't done so already, make sure that you like this video, follow the channel as well as hit the alert bell so that you don't miss any notifications so that you don't miss any of the wonderful videos that we share here on the Newfound Faith YouTube channel.